Well, hello folks, and welcome to episode 152 of Retro Power Uncut. And you join me by the Jaguar uh, Churchill project, as we call it, the two-door coupe conversion of a uh, Mark II Jag. And since last week, we've progressed in a few areas. First one, front wing this side, I think that was just welded in and the initial planishing going on last week. Tom's now finished that planishing off, got all that smoothed and uh, all in the right place and then he's used his little fixture that he created uh, to check that the offset of the wing to the hub uh, is the same both sides and that the profile wing to hub is all correct from side to side so the car's symmetrical and the wheel clearance is matched from one side of the car to the other so that's all good it's got all that looking rather nice as you can see so just make out the weld line still through just going around there but that's all uh, that's all looking pretty good uh, and then Tom's moved on to the boot lid now. He's just looking at various other little bits of metal tweaking that have got to be done. There were some high spots in the boot lid that needed just uh, sorting out. So he's just gone over that and he's doing some, a little bit of shrinking, just taking down a couple of highs in that, just to get the line from the boot lid to the rear scuttle a bit better, just to make everything line up a little bit nicer there. Uh, we've got a little bit to do on the roof at the front as well. There's a bit of roof that's dropped down. I think it was like that when the car came here um, and it hadn't been addressed yet, but we've just got to tweak the roof line a little bit there as well. But we're just waiting for, for um, which is actually out at the minute, uh, literally now, picking up some screen seals from Martin Rovies in the Eaton so that we can fit the front screen and get that in place just so we can check the fit around there. The way the front screens fit in these means you can't really just offer them into the aperture very neat, very easily without a seal. So we're going to get the seal fitted, get that in there and check all that area. And then uh, Stu has been working on a couple of things. He's been doing a nifty little bit of engineering for the um, boot hinges on this. Originally they had a coil spring. Now the boot's are a lot lighter. Uh, they had like a pigtail spring that opened the, uh, that assisted the boot lid lift on this. And the problem with those is that they're not very easy to sort of lighten in their assistance um, quantity. And, the, 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 and because the boot lid's now aluminium, it's a lot lighter than it was originally. And with the original springs, it flies up too, far too forcefully. So we want to be able to control that, make it more gentle. And the easiest way to do that is via a gas spring, because then we can adjust the pressure in the gas spring and make the boot open nice and gently. Uh, and Stu's come up with a neat way of fitting those into the original hinge mechanisms with some um, fabricated tubular assemblies. This is basically a tube with a lug on the bottom with, the gas, with a gas spring fitted to that onto a nice little stainless steel shoulder bolt. Uh, then the, uh, gas, uh, the body of the gas spring goes through the centre of the tube and then on the other end of that tube near the, um, near the top of the gas spring where the, where the, where the rod goes into it, um, on the outside of that tube there are two uh, threaded lugs, threaded uh, bosses that then take two more shoulder bolts and some bronze bushes that go through the original um, hinge assemblies uh, and then the rod from the, um, from the gas spring goes onto the uh, body of the car so, and that's what gives the resistance for the boot lid and it means that the springs working all really neatly contained doesn't take up any space that we we don't have in the boot and everything works really well so really nice little bit of engineering that and that's all in and working we're just waiting for the, the final gas springs we've got a set of gas springs in there we're waiting for the final set of gas springs for that so that's done and then Stu has also been working on the exhaust system. Uh, we were waiting on a couple of bits of bends and a bit of tube for that. It's a, uh, I've mentioned last week, two and a quarter inch tubing. We were waiting for a couple of bits. We've got those now. Um, and yes, we've got those from Fabco, uh, I believe. They've arrived and he's getting those welded in to do the next sort of steps on the exhaust system, which are coming together. I don't think he's got too much left to do on that. Without looking under the car, I can't actually remember. But I don't think he's got too much left to do on that. I can't remember whether we mentioned, did we mention the power steering pump fun and games? I'm not sure whether we did or not now. But we, um, I'll, t I'll mention it now, just in case we didn't. Uh, this would have been uh, a week before last, actually, but I don't think I actually mentioned it on the video. 
we are using this is a this engine i think i've referred to it as an x300 engine it's actually they were they were kind of designed for the x3 but they were actually designed for the late they were sort of prototyped in the late xj40s and then fitted to x300 as the first big volume car they were fitted to but this one's actually out of an xjs because obviously the xjs also had the same engine what we discovered despite my protestations otherwise was that the x300 power steering pump, which is a shaft-driven item on these engines, is different to the XJS one, which I didn't know. Uh, I do now. And the fittings lend themselves to the installation in this Mark II Jaguar much better on the X300 pump uh, than they do on the XJS pump. So Stu swapped the pump to one that we had from the supercharged 4-litre X300 AJ16 engine onto this engine and everything's sort of fallen into place beautifully for the power steering um, pipe work. So I don't, I don't know, I don't think I've mentioned that before, but yeah, that's the, the reservoir's now in place. Stu's made the bracket for that, and now he's got the pipe work in place to feed the um, power steering pump and the power steering pump to feed the rack. And it's all laid out really nicely and everything works. So that was a bit of a win. Um, his, 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 I, his point, his um, insistence on checking the other engine was worthwhile, because I just said, oh, they'll be the same, Jack never changed anything. And sure enough, they did actually change it, and to our advantage so uh, very useful that i think that's pretty much where we're at on the churchill project um we've mentioned that we, we've uh, then we've got the allegro which i'll probably knock the wing off the wheel again like i've done before there's uh, not a vast amount of progress occurred on this one in here uh, but Cal will uh, relay more about the, the goings on with that, I think, uh, in terms of some CAD, there's CAD work afoot, um, which I'll, uh, I'll, le I'll leave Cal to mention, because that's all that's really changed on this one. In the background, there's some progress going on with the air conditioning condenser. I've received the uh, Porsche fitment, Porsche 911 fitment air conditioning condenser now. I bought a, a sort of a new old stock cheap one to trial because I knew I'd probably end up having to try and weld it. Uh, I've machined a fitting for that to get a pipe off it at a better angle uh, and I'm going to have a go, I might have a go this afternoon actually, um, at welding that and seeing how successful I can be at welding it without damaging the braze in the core of the condenser. If I can get away with welding it, I think we have a solution for the AC condenser in this. It's not the biggest, it's not going to have a huge capacity, but it will have enough capacity for what it needs to do in this. So that's uh, where we're at on that. Beyond that, again, the CAD work continues on the arches, but again, I'll let Cal, uh, I'll, I'll let Cal mention that. So uh, we'll leave that there. Next along the line, we are with the E-Type, where Sam's been forging ahead um, with, a, with a couple of other sets of hands to help him now and again at times because they've been wielding the, uh, the rather bulky V12 uh, I've forgotten what it weighed. They weighed it, and I've already forgotten how much it weighed. Off the top of my head, something like 365 kilos for the engine and transmission, I think. It's blooming heavy. Um, but yeah, they've uh, got the engine and transmission refitted and back lined up where it needs to be in the correct position in the car. And the next, because the next steps really in terms of fabrication, Following the sills, sorry, I should backtrack slightly. Sam's finished getting the outer sills welded on. We, he was starting that last week. He's now finished getting the outer sills all welded on. So that's all done now. The weld dressing still to do on the inside of the car, but on the outside, it's all done. The next step then is to finish the tunnel. In order to finish the tunnel and the floor sections either side of it, we need to do the uh, seat mounting boxes. And in order to do the seat mounting boxes, we've got to do the transmission mounting because that ties into the seat mounting boxes. And in order to do the transmission mounting, we need the engine and transmission in. So last week, Sam fitted the new GM tail house into the box and picked one of the two um, rubber mountings, which is that one, uh, to, to trial fit with. So that bolts onto the gearbox, that way up even. That bolts onto the gearbox, onto the transmission, uh, and then that will fit in the underside of the tunnel down there. And then he's gonna fabricate a, a small mounting that transfers the force from that onto the sort of shoulders of the transmission tunnel. Before he does that, he's got to put a new base in that section of the transmission tunnel. So his current unpleasant job is getting all the spot welds ground out on the underside of that piece of tunnel, which is uh, laborious and very dirty. He's just getting through that at the moment. 
and then he's going to get make this carry on making the seat boxes there's one there he's going to fabricate two new seat boxes the shape of the other ones was not ideal for what we want the original ones so he's fabricating two new seat boxes get them uh, aligned and fitted and just double check the seat alignment and then those will also then tie into the transmission mounting either side of the uh, tunnel it'll all be easier to explain once all the bits are in place on that so i'm not going to go into vastly more detail but it'll all become obvious once it's all in, back in the car uh, and once all that's in, then the sides of the tunnel and all the front section of the tunnel can be fabricated because the uh, will have dealt with the uh, the points of constraint, if you like, the uh, the constraining factors will have been dealt with, and then at that point we can do all the sheet metal work around those constraints. So yeah, that's all coming together really well. I'll say engine and gearbox back in, throttle body's back on because we were double checking the bonnet clearance because we've actually changed very slightly the height of the transmission, which has altered the engine angle. We wanted to just be doubly sure that we've got throttle body to engine bonnet clearance and we do have and everything's okay under there so yeah that's where we're at on that one moving on from that we've got the uh, the other allegro project lucky strike 2 but um uh, we, we haven't actually got a name for this one yet but we're uh, cracking on with this i'm just gonna have a sip of this because i'm getting a dry mouth so on to the second allegro Bobby has principally been working on the sills. So he's got the inner sill structures pieced together there. The outer sills have been uh, painted with epoxy primer and are leaning up against the wall over there. The inner sills have also been painted with epoxy primer and are on the car. Scott's been working on the A panel area, getting the A panel sections made up, tech screwed in place, making the spouts, if you like, or the, uh, the sort of little water shoots that go on the ends of the scuttle area. These are the drains that come all the way through the A panel and drop the water out of the scuttle area. Any water that goes through in through the heater intake at the bottom of the windscreen will come out via these and drain outside the car um, rather than getting sort of into anything. Um, so the, the, that, that, that spout is cut through the, uh, the outer face of the A panel and that will be done once the outer section is put in. At the moment he's just fabricating the inner section, getting all that screwed in place and all lined up. <clears throat> uh, once he's done both sides, the, the other side is not quite at that stage yet, but once he's got both sides done, the reinforcer, you can see he's got the little reinforcer here, which I'll probably get it the wrong way around now, almost certainly. Can't even remember how that goes now. Goes in there somehow, but I can't remember where it goes. <laughs> Reinforce the section that lives inside the uh, inside the A panel just to tie that together. I think it goes between here and the and the A pillar and just ties all that lot together. And then you'll make the outer sections as well and all get all that screwed together, get the other side to the same state, uh, and then it will be starting work on the scuttle closures, the front and rear panels there, and to that end I think he's bolted the um, scuttle plate in the scuttle in place with one of the, the Honda brace so that you can start templating up this section here um, and then he's got the these that's the out they're the outer a panel sections that's uh, i think this is that side actually but they're the, they're the panels for there he's got those made up so it's all 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 coming together on that front and then bobby's just moved on to uh doing the final checks and templates for the rear uh, the rear section of the boot floor where it ties into the rear panel getting all that finished off and making the reinforcer bits to uh, to tie all the back of the car together so yeah i think uh, by end of play tomorrow we're going to be we won't be there but we'll be fairly close to having the uh, the car all tied together certainly by end of next week body shell should be should be mounted to the floor pan and it should all be i think be able to be at the position where it can come off the jig so yeah that's all looking pretty good i think from there we will move through to the body prep yeah we're kind of on the final throws of paint prep on both both cars sort of almost not quite in parallel but almost in parallel it's been a couple of two steps forward one step back a little bit on the the on some of the front end on the chevette again just panel fit ups and flexible panels and things not being quite where they should be and all that usual all the usual panel fit caper but we're uh, we're pretty much there with that mark's been busy on just getting the front corners right on that and doing the final uh, the final fettling necessary i think that's then due for its final epoxy primer on all of the outer front end parts once that's done then that can be blocked and that's pretty much at the uh, stages of final paint 
And Gaz looks to me like he's masking up, ready for interior paint. Yeah. Yeah. Do We've got the, the. You're not going to do it at the same time. No. 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 no it's a bit of a maskathon. Basically, you're trying to do the inside of the car and the outside at the same time is just a, a basically results in something going badly wrong normally. If you try and try and bite off more than you can chew on that sort of job, it normally goes wrong. So he's getting the inside all masked up so he can bag the outside of the car up, paint the inside, let that go off, be um, all be safe. And then you can unmask the outside of the car, remask all the apertures so the inside's masked up and then paint the outside. It involves slightly more masking. But if something goes wrong trying to do it all in one go, it, that, that costs you way more time than the time spent doing the extra bit of masking. So it's just, uh, you're better to be safe than sorry on stuff like that, really. So yeah, the, uh, the interior masking going on and interior colour going on next on that. And I think that about sums up where we're at this side. So at that point, I will hand over to Cal. Right. Well, thank you, Nat. And I'm back. Well, I must admit, Nat did an exceptional job last week. I, probably, I watched it and thought, I don't think I'm needed on these videos anymore. That was spot on. However, it is nice to be back. And, and it, although, I, when I was away last week, I was in Catalonia, which, for those who don't know, is a small island off the west coast of Greece, um, which was absolutely wonderful. However, good coffee was not something that was readily available there. So, um, very glad to be back with my unlimited supply of roundstone coffee. Well, I say unlimited, it's limited by our ability to actually pay for it, but uh, it's still nonetheless nice to have. And on that subject, the mugs, as you see here, and of course the t-shirts are available in our shop on our website, www.retropower.co.uk, where you will also find pages uh, talking about all the projects that we're doing and uh, there's a great page about all of the members of staff who work here might have to cut this bit it's too much of a, it's too much of a gap <laughs> uh, something else that i'm going to mention is that we some people might know mark one escort mark two escort world cup cross members use essentially a leaf spring shackle bush uh, to mount the engine and if, casting your mind back to when we did Gordon Murray's escort we weren't very happy with how rigid the usually available ones were and we ended up making our own batch and we thought well there was no point making one pair so we had a, a small run of them done which sold out pretty much overnight um, and since then I think we've made one or two more batches now we keep getting inquiries about them and we have been waiting quite a, a long time since the last batch we made. However, I can confirm we now have another batch on the shelf. Uh, they're available in our web shop as well. So if you are the owner of a Mark I or Mark II Escort with a World Cup cross member and are not entirely happy with the amount of engine vibration that is transferred into the shell, then get yourself on there, buy yourself a pair. That was the purpose of them. They're, they're a, a lower shore number. They're basically a softer material compared to the, all of the other available ones. Uh, to cut down engine vibration, usually in road cars. Uh, and speaking of escorts, there's one right here. Uh, so, Anthony has been on with front end cooler pack uh, assembly. So, we've got fabricated aluminium radiator that's been now painted in satin black, and then we've got the air conditioning condenser underneath. I'm sure by this point, if you're a regular watcher, you'll have realised that these cars are having air conditioning. Um, we're going with an electric compressor, which is nestled down here in the inner wing. Um, the beauty of that being twofold, actually. One, it's not doesn't have to be mounted to the engine and, and be another addition to the belt train. Um, but also, you can ramp up the compressor speed. Um, and because we're running PDM, um, I think it's Motec PDMs are running on these cars. We're actually going to be using the PDMs to control the compressor, compressor speed strategy. So we can use inputs from, uh, because the, the PDM talks to the engine ECU via CAN, it can know any engine parameter at any time. So we can use all sorts of parameters, uh, including things like voltage level, uh, engine RPM, temperature, and we can, we can 
consider all of those factors when we're telling the aircon compressor how fast to run, when to run, etc. Um, which I think will be quite useful. So it'll be interesting to see when we actually get to the programming stage how Alex works out that uh, programming and how we get that to, to, uh, to work in an optimum fashion. Um, one example of how that might be deployed is that we will also have throttle positions. So you, we could program it so that if you go over a th certain throttle uh, opening, it cuts the compressor out altogether and gives you a bit of a power gain. As uh, I, remember, <laughs> I remember my dad doing when he used to drive, I think he had a, a, two, a Nissan 200 SX, which must have been like a 96, 97 maybe. And uh, I clearly remember every time he wanted to overtake somebody, reaching down, turn off the air con, a <laughs> bit of extra power. Uh, so yes, air conditioning, electric compressor, the dryer's just nestling down here, so Anthony was doing the final bracket for that last week, which just came back from Zyland coating earlier this week, and actually he also made the brackets for the twin horns that sit here, um, that's also been Zyland coated, so we've now got everything in place in there, horns, dryer, condenser, um, when the, we were doing the metal work, the mounts for this were done, and the they made all the pipe work, so there's actually a hard line directly joining the dryer to the, com the condenser down here because it's a very tight space. Um, and then the rest of the hoses have now been crimped and put in. Um, so yeah, just uh, edging our way through assembly. I think he's uh, finished the fuel tank installation, which I think Nat showed last week. Um, and Alex is continuing with the wiring loom, which is going quite well. He started with the uh, engine ECU inside the car harness. So that one basically is the branch that goes from the ECU to the bulkhead connector. It then has a branch going off which interfaces with the main chassis loom. And then on this side of the engine bay, there'll be a mating connector on the bulkhead which will actually go to the engine itself. Um, I won't bother going into the detail on the engine wiring this week, but perhaps in the next couple of weeks when Alex is cracking on with the main chassis harness, we might go into some of the detail involved with the wiring side of things. Uh, so that's where we're at with that. Um, Land Cruiser, James has been doing the revised breather for the fuel tank. So I think that mentioned last week, we had misjudged the height of the breather um, for the fuel tank. We thought it was high enough that you wouldn't get fuel coming out of it when you brim the tank. But thankfully we discovered whilst brimming the tank to check the, um, the, the filler hose was up to scratch. Now we've replaced that. Uh, we did get some coming out of the breather. So we've, Jim's done like a formed aluminium hard line that comes out of the fuel tank enclosure and actually loops up neatly over the fuel filler um, and back into the tank enclosure and that way. So I think we're just waiting for some bulkhead fittings to come, the, the compression fittings that work with that hard line from ATEC. Uh, and that'll allow us to finish that job. Uh, and then we are pretty much down to road testing. I think it's seat belts and road testing. Um, I feel like there was something else we've done on this in the engine bay, but I can't think what it would be off the top of my head. Uh, no, maybe not. <laughs> so, Morris, uh, again, basically in the, in the latter stages, you, you'll notice this, I haven't got a lot to report on this week because it's, it was a bank holiday Monday. We've only been working two days uh, since the last video was filmed. Um, so Morris, I was going through some PDM programming stuff on it yesterday. Um, the boot release was one thing I was looking at, basically going through a few little niggles that I'd noticed along the way. Um, the boot release wasn't working unless you had the ignition on uh, from the, re the remote fob that was. So a little bit of a reprogram on the PDM for that, and this is where you start to see the beauty of uh, PDM stuff. Um, I also had to put a diode in, this was probably an oversight on the part of Max who did the wiring loom. The uh, hazards, the, the PDM has to be woken up by a signal from the ignition switch uh, so that it doesn't drain the battery when the ignition is off. Um, so the unit basically goes to sleep. Now because we need the hazards to work when the unit when the ignition is not on we have an, another feed to the same wake pin if you like on the pdm from the hazard switch to put 12 volts to the pdm and wake it up if you have the hazards on what i don't think max had factored in was the fact that actually it can back feed down that wire and i noticed when the differential when i had the problem with the diff i had to pull over put the hazards on turn the key off and the engine carried on running i was like oh that's the, what's, what's going on here then um, and realized very quickly if you then turn the hazards off the engine went off and it was because the wake um, 
pin feed from the hazards was actually keeping the uh, uh, acting as if the ignition was on. Um, so I put a diode in that just to sort that out. Um, yeah, so we really those last little details just tickling through. I needed to just realign the driver's door frame slightly to get the glass going up a bit more convincingly into its channel at the top. Um, little details, I'm just checking the seals as well. I wanted to make sure that the seals were definitely contacting all the way around. Um, tend to use a little trick there of just doing the tiniest smear of something like WD-40 or grease, something that stays on there and doesn't immediately evaporate off. Uh, and then shut the door and you can kind of see the imprint of it around but that all looks good on both doors so just going through those last little uh, last little details really on that um, so that's where we're at with that uh, i'm going to mention the camaro briefly there's a couple of things we've had back the caps in here we, we machined these a while ago actually they had them anodized i've just got them back from bruce who's done the engraving for us on them uh, I just trial fitted them today to make sure they all look good, but yeah, really happy with how they've come out. We've just went with text on them in the end, so this one's power steering and the hydraulic brake booster, oil for both, so we've just put power steering and brake booster on that one. And then engine coolant, do not open when hot on that one, and I'm really happy with how they're looking. Uh, and then the other thing with this is we've had the engine wiring harness through, I think it arrived yesterday from Speartech. Uh, so thank you, Justin, I think it is at Speartech. Uh, looks like a nice job, so looking forward to getting that installed. Um, and I think actually with with us having finished the exhaust on this now, and I think those caps pretty much wrap up the plumbing in here, I think getting that engine wiring harness in here really is the last thing necessary to fire it up. Now we, we still need to do the chassis harness, but I think the, the, the engine harness is so simple, the temptation to just put 12 volts to the relevant wires may kick in too much and we might, might have to do that just so we can uh, fire this up and hear it run. Um, so yeah, that's where we're at with that. Uh, and Allegro. So uh, Luke is on with quite a lot of Allegro interior design stuff at the minute, which has been on the cards for a while. Just before I went away, they did a scan of the inside, basically with the dash in place. We've used the original dash, but modified, and it's been lengthened slightly. It's got basically been extended at the front to bring it further into the car. Um, so I think the actual structure of the original dash piece is going to be retained. We we're going to do some modifications to it. But then all of the lower sections, so everything below that upper sort of raised up section of dash, where the glove boxes would normally be, where the steering column goes, all of that will be one off. And the whole central section, which is normally kind of a flimsy plastic piece in the Allegro. Um, so we've been going through kind of the motions of starting to rough out the ideas for that. We, we did some renderings when we did the initial egg rough exterior renderings, we did some ideas for the interior um, and now, now we've kind of got to the point where we know more about the details of what components are going to go into that interior, uh, we're sort of starting to rough it out in CAD and take it to the next level so that, this is where the beauty of the 3D scanning comes in, we've literally got the scan of the interior, we can design not just cosmetically but physically design all the parts and they will then be made from those CAD models, whether they be a machine part or whether we machine moulds to make composite parts, whether we machine books to do vacuum formed parts, whether we 3D print parts, uh, we can literally make them straight from the CAD. So we can not only visualise how it's all going to look, we can actually make the parts. So that's what Luke's on with at the minute. Uh, yesterday we were having a good old uh, head scratch about the layout. We want to keep the two clock dash in there. Some of them had like an additional little, I think it was a fuel gauge and a temp gauge each side which would be the obvious way to get more data there, but I just none of us like the look of it. We really like the little hexagonal kind of two clock dash, and we like the idea of having just a speedo and a taco there. Um, so we're trying to come up with a way of getting some additional data uh, in there, and we we're trying to come up with a way of putting a screen somewhere, but we don't want it to look too intrusive, and it's, it's still up in the air, but we've got an idea for maybe in the central part where the ashtray used to be at the top of the dash having a small screen and we were obviously all very excited to try and come up with an idea whereby the screen could come up from where the ashtray used to be maybe even with the ashtray lid on it or it flips out of the way but we're obviously trying to also balance out the amount of time that's going to be involved with that so it may be that we would do a machined or 3d printed insert that kind of sinks a little a small screen into the dash and then that will probably give us our additional data so we can have fuel level, temperature, pressures, basically any engine data. Um, and we'll design that graphically to look kind of cool in 70s or maybe sort of probably early 80s digital kind of LED type display, maybe little bar graphs or something. 
Um, so we were throwing lots of ideas around yesterday, but we're, we're kind of homing in on where we want to be with it. We're actually using the Integra uh, heater control panel. Because we're using the Integra HVAC system, uh, it kind of makes sense to use the controls because they'll be able to control it directly. One of the temperature slider is actually a physical cable control and that will connect to the cable on the HVAC unit. So it sort of makes sense to do it. We wouldn't have done had it not looked cosmetically in keeping, but actually remarkably, considering it's a 1990s unit, it really doesn't look out of place in a sort of 80s or even late 70s environment. It's all, it's all fairly kind of basic, simple fonts and the little red and green red and blue temperature slider looks very similar to the original Allegro one so I think we're going to use the uh, Integra heater control unit uh, little tiny screen probably the the small Motec screen we can get as the additional data then our own version of the original instrument cluster but with sort of modern stepper motor gauges in and then the lower section we haven't got any major plans for at the minute it's probably just going to be largely a cosmetic piece don't want it to extend all the way down that's something I've said from the start is that we want to the dash to end underneath with a gap between that and the floor um, because I just don't want it to look too integrated. It's something that's quite of a, a sort of notable feature of the Allegro and cars of that era is that you have this kind of open floor space that goes right under the dash. Um, so yeah, watch this space, essentially on the interior design for the Allegro, but that's uh, what Luke's on with. And I think George is just in the tail end of the bodywork design for the Allegro. So watch this space on that and we'll see you again next week. Go and get yourself a mug and uh, escort World Cup cross member mounts, even if you don't have one, just get them anyway.